Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Buddhang Dhammang Sanghang Namasami So in the past few weeks, we've gotten to talk about um, devas, Mara, death, politics. And so I was thinking of like the one black sheep of American Buddhism we haven't talked about, well, one of several, but the one we'll actually bring up is uh, body contemplation. So uh, who here has found themselves confused or sometimes off-put by elements of the tradition so far, just a bit... Oh, yes, good. Well, today will be a doozy. <laughs> so, the Buddha recommended four protective meditations, and the four include uh, metta, loving kindness, buddhanusati, or recollection of the Buddha and the qualities of the awakened mind and heart, um, marananusati, recollection of death, which brings about the sense of urgency and understanding of what's meaningful and worthwhile in our life versus trivial, and body contemplation, a subha. And this fourth, uh, you'll notice that those protective meditations are too bright and too dark, or rather too that um, reveal something beyond the veil of what we usually become fixated on, namely loving kindness and the awakened mind. And then two of them are focused on dropping the veil that so often hypnotizes us, namely the body and the ups and downs of this life. So, body contemplation. When the Buddha when monastics become ordained, the first five objects we are given for practice, uh, it's not the breath, it's not loving kindness, it's nails, teeth, hair of the head, hair of the body, um, and skin. So that's fun. Um, <laughs> and this can be really uh, strange to people in the West, uh, you know, which is why it's so rarely taught it's much easier to give a Dhamma talk on loving kindness than to tell people to think about their spleens. And yet, when it's very interesting in the Connected Discourses, which is one of the Buddhist compilations of, of the Buddhist teachings, there's different chapters dedicated to different uh, sort of lists or concepts. And the chapter on the deathless Strangely, it's interesting to see what was picked for the first verse in every chapter. And the Asankata Samyutta, the chapter on this, was begins with a verse about the body. The Buddha says, what is the deathless? It is the cessation of greed, hatred, and delusion. What is the path to the deathless? Mindfulness immersed in the body. And there's another sutta where the Buddha says that even as the ocean encompasses all water that flows into it, even so, mindfulness of the body encompasses and develops all states there are that partake of true knowledge. So there's this strange irony in the Buddhist teaching where what we one of the most direct routes to realizing that which transcends the changing nature of much of our experience is through the most chain, one of the most changeable aspects of our experience, namely this body. And a few really important caveats to lay at the beginning. Um, first of all, if... Uh, Body contemplation is not supposed to necessarily make 
just see the body as uh, disgusting. The word often used is asuba. Suba means beautiful, and a means not. So there's this uh, quality of not beautiful, not sexually attractive. And um, where so many people's body image uh, issues, of which, uh, especially for women, I think it, it's a huge, huge thing in people's lives, so much of this is comparing one's body to the bodies of others and thinking one's body is not uh, good enough. Good body contemplation should actually mitigate that comparison because you see that all bodies are just these funny kind of awkward things. I mean, they're uh, magically complicated and complex uh, things, but they are not, uh, when seen clearly, um, say, actually beautiful or worthy of becoming obsessed by. And to see that clearly um, allows one a tool to, first of all, mitigate uh, sexual fever. And that's a, a big issue in today's society. Uh, the world is very focused on making us whipping up us into a fever around sex. And half of divorces uh, now uh, cite porn uh, addiction as one of the main causes. So to have a tool in your tool belt where if, say, you're um, drawn towards breaking your morality uh, through a draw of sexual desire, or you find that you're just obsessed too often with these thoughts that are just inflaming and not useful, just to have something in your tool belt you can bring out and cool yourself down is not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing. However, there's something much deeper in that body contemplation of the five locuses of identity, the five khandas is what they're called, the aggregates in Buddhism, the body, feelings, perceptions, uh, mental formations or thoughts, and consciousness. These are each things we take as we sort of attach to as a self. And the body is uh, such a strong one. And where we really see how deluded we are with regard to death, you know, there's so many movies about someone comes down with a terminal illness and then transforms their whole life. We all knew that if we really understood our mortality, we wouldn't live probably quite like we're living now. But our delusion about the body is so deep, we have no idea we're deluded. It's pretty astounding when people get their first glimpse of this sort of trick that's being pulled. It's interesting and it's uh, heart-rending too, depending on how it happens. I remember going to the hospital in uh, Ubon and the ward was full, so we were sort of in the hallway. And you could just... You know, the bodies were being bodies, and people were moaning, and there were fluids, and the smell of fluids, and there was just this sense of this gigantic betrayal of people's bodies in one fell moment, and none of them had, or very few had prepared. And you could see the heartbreak and the confusion. So, so much of practice is preparing for what will happen. The body will age, it will become sick, um, and it will die. So, how can we just get some perspective on it. Let go of our attachment just a little so that when that happens, our hearts don't break as well and we're able to face it with equanimity. And this attachment to the body is so deep that a huge number of our defilements are kind of wound into the body. And you'll find that good body contemplation, you know, in the West people love these sort of highfalutin Zen koans of, you know, what, is your, what was your face before you were born? But contemplation of the body rips apart the deluded sense of self in this nitty-gritty way that, that is hard, that's really powerful. And um, you find that if done correctly, it shouldn't lead to aversion or a sense of actually aversion towards the body but rather a sense of cooling and brightness. It's as if this heart, you know, you, you think about what the heart is in Buddhism, this luminous aspect of consciousness, and what happens when it really thinks it's 
bone, calcium, pus, blood, hair, how much would that darken it? And so all you're doing is drawing back the veil a little bit. And what's interesting is if you start to use body contemplation, not only might you find that a lot of these deep defilements, like your anger at people, your greed, just it's like you're hamstringing them. But also, you realize how much you judge other people from their bodies. Ajahn Panyavada says like 90% of our impressions of people initially comes from their body. Ugly, beautiful, attractive. Being attractive is pretty much, it's just as difficult as being not attractive because you always wonder if people are approaching you because they like you or because they're attracted to you. And if you can step back and just see the body as a body, you begin to perceive the heart shining through more clearly from the people you meet, and you can really touch them in a different way um, as human beings, as hearts. And you judge them less as old or unattractive or this or that, and what a gift to be able to give people, to not judge them by their body, and for them to know that you're really there for their heart. And it's nice to say, but to really do it, we need to address the underlying attachment a little bit, at least to gain some perspective. So, when the Buddha speaks about how to, you know, in, in the Thai tradition, uh, body contemplation is, well, first, it's important to know your personality type. So in Buddhism, we have three kinds of personality types mainly, and it's based on what sort of defilement is most prominent in you. So you have your greed types. Um, so if you really like sweet things, and if the first thing you notice when you walk in a room is what you want, you might be a greed type, maybe. We have our aversive types, so that's, well, you're aversive, uh, and when you walk in a room, you notice what you don't like. Um, the commentaries also say aversive types walk on their heels a lot, so maybe. Then you have um, your delusion types, and uh, delusion types, uh, they say, they kind of, the commentaries say they kind of walk with this sort of flopping gait, and that's when you walk into a room and you're a bit confused. The issue with delusion types is none of us really know if we're delusion types. If you're deluded, you don't know. So we all might be. And to be honest, we're all a nice mix of all these things. Um, so, but picking out your prominent one can be helpful sometimes because if you're an aversive type, then body contemplation can be something you have to use very sparingly and carefully. It'll make you a bit angry and you'll wake up a few days later feeling kind of like an angry bear. But if you're a greed type, it's very safe to use um, and very useful to use. So there are three roots to body contemplation. Oh, and I should say that the breakthrough of this aggregate, um, seeing through it, is often characterized as so powerful, it's a paramount to stream entry. It's often such an important vision that people emerge um, sort of having glimpsed something, the deathless, the first glimpse of the deathless. That's often in the Terigata, the verses of the elder monks and nuns, seeing through the body is equated often with the first glimpse of enlightenment. And if you don't think you're deluded about the body, it's interesting to just contemplate some things. Um, first is your reaction to getting, getting bit by a mosquito. So in Thailand, you have ample opportunity for this uh, to think about. And I just started noticing when I meditated, um, if a mosquito landed on me, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't just the bite or a little tickle. It was the sense of indignation, like, how dare that mosquito, like, and violation just to see that, like, absurd reaction. The next is just to see what happens when you, when a hair falls in some soup. Both the hair and the soup suddenly become disgusting. It's your hair. <laughs> What's happening there? Like, what is the body trying to point to? Same with fingernail clippings. If that gets in your soup, I mean, that's, 
That's one thing. Why? <laughs> like, why does that make any sense? So we begin to look... Anyways. <laughs> and, and really understanding that we're preparing for letting go. And this, this can be a gift. So the first way the Buddha speaks about contemplating the body is by contemplating the 32 parts, they're called. So it's a list he gives, um, where basically it's just a list of the, of the body parts. Um, uh, hair of the head, hair of the body, nails, teeth, skin. Those are the five external parts that you see that shield everything. But then it goes on, and you speak about bones, blood, pus, sinews, brain, phlegm, tendons, uh, you could go on. And what's useful here is just to go through this list. When you do body contemplation, you can bring it to mind if lust is really hitting you and you need to use it, like a break the glass kind of thing. But the other time that you can use it is when the mind is really calm for a time and then it begins to move with this inexorable energy. It's like that gla glass of samadhi is full. Samatha, tranquility, is full. And this can be especially useful on retreat. Uh, most of the time, you meditate a bit in the morning or the evening, and you build up this samadhi, and then it kind of bleeds out through the day. And then you come back to stillness and sort of refill. But on retreat, you'll find there comes a point where that glass is really full and you are not getting any more calm and you do not want to go back to the breath. And it doesn't just feel like distraction, it's like the mind has genuinely had enough. And this is when vipassana, insight in the sense of body contemplation is so useful because that's exactly what your mind will want in those moments. So try this in a meditation session or in a longer retreat. Once the mind is rested and is bright and starts to move, then let it move, but let it contemplate the body. And what you might notice is it's really interested. It knows it's been missing something, so it, it actually really digs in. And that's a good sign. And then you can let it play around. And it's a very active meditation, you'll see. But what you'll find is there's this sense of, there should be the sense of cooling, of brightening, and of the mind almost releasing from this cocoon of the body in the sense of growing wide and bright and buoyant. That's a good sign. And one issue with samatha or samadhi, tranquility practice in the West, is people don't teach body contemplation. So it's like missing half of the picture. Uh, this is such an essential part of the path, and it's everywhere in the suttas, and it is not really taught in the West. So it's like trying to practice by hopping on one foot. There comes a point where you do need that other foot, or it's really useful to have. So this is when you use body contemplation. And what might happen is you suddenly, um, so when the mind is rested for a time, then to use these 32 parts, you begin to list them. Hair of the head, hair of the body, nails, teeth, skin. And you can picture them, bones, blood. And see which one interests you. Which one kind of does the mind grab onto? Usually bones will be very reliably reliable for people. That's a really powerful object. Um, often, though, hair or skin will also get people. And then once you find an object that the mind kind of likes, it, it, it can kind of get its teeth into, then you contemplate. Uh, the Thai word is picharana. And this is something you sort of have to figure out for yourself. But you can sort of go through... You can use images or words or feeling in your body, and all three are useful to use at different points. So with the bones, you can picture the bone. You can say just bone, bone, or you can picture the bone and then picture a stone and realize that they're the same thing. It's just calcium. There's no difference. You can picture your vertebrae as a series of river, river pebbles. You can apply a word to this saying bones, stone, bones, stone, or these are just bones, they're not you. These are just bones, they're not you. You can break the bone down, crack it in half, and watch it disintegrate, and 
if it helps, you can let it disintegrate into the ground and join the forest and all that. Um, and if you find one of these images that kind of works, it, it'll feel really interesting and good, then just repeat it while it works and let the mind sink into it. With, uh, you know, with the skin, this is going to get a little bit raunchy, uh, you can <laughs> um, peel it off. Uh, imagine what the body looks like without skin. It's not as beautiful. And men and women look pretty much the same without their skin. That sounds intense, but it's really useful if you're trying to dispel lust. And it's what the body actually is. Um, if uh, you're thinking about hair, really picture a hair close up. Imagine it uh, growing and then falling off. Uh, what happens there? With the skin and the hair, you can imagine how after a few days of not washing them, they become covered in oil. They start to smell. They're dirty. This body is quite dirty. If we don't wash it, it becomes very unattractive very quickly. We have to constantly clean it, constantly tend to it. And if the mind's calm, then when you bring this to mind, there'll be a sense of like, oh. There'll be a sense of really understanding. And sometimes people's first moment of really deep insight will come after contemplating the body from a place of calm. And suddenly you look at your arm and you realize it's not you, it's just a body. And there's not a version there, it's just this thing that you identified completely with. It's, it's changing, its cells change every seven years. You can't even, it doesn't look the same as it did when you were a child. Often you can't actually control it. If your foot falls asleep, if you're ill, it won't do what you want. These bodies don't do what you want. And it will age and it will leave you and you'll give it back. There was one uh, mo monk who approached, or a lay person who approached a teacher named Tan Por Lee, and he said someone had come up to him and said, you're a Buddhist, right? You know, you don't believe this body is you, so why can't I just hit the body? Like, why can't I just beat you up? And, Aj and the lay person didn't know what to say. And Ajahn Lee said, tell him you're borrowing it and you have to take good care of it. <laughs> so this is the other big caveat in Buddhism, in the body contemplation, is we have great gratitude for our bodies. And even as we let go of the physical form of the body as a locus of identity, we become friends with it. We develop loving kindness in the sense of appreciating what it's given us, how hard we work it how it's a path of practice and a vehicle of that. And through a development of the interoceptive sense of the body through the breath, the subtle body, we learn to draw pleasure from it. The Buddha said, the world and the ending of the world all lie within this fathom-long body. Even as we become friends with it, we learn not to ask more of it than it can give us and not to identify with something that is just made of the world. It's just elements. So there's other in sort of things you can bring to mind. You can, um, with these 32 parts, you can contemplate how everything you see of another's body is dead tissue. Even the eyes are dead. Um, it just looks alive because they're moist. Uh, the skin is dead, um, but uh, if any live cells were on the surface, they would be very painful. So you just see the dead skin on top. Hair is dead. That can be a pretty intense perception, but it works. The second way of contemplating the body is through the elements. And this is a bit easier and less intense, and uh, especially for people who are aversive or have some issues with their body image. And this is when the Buddha said to look at the body as earth, air, fire, uh, wind. And this can seem like some arcane or medieval classification system, but really it's just the way of looking at dividing the body up. Um, you know, you think of the periodic table or something, and uh, quarks, gluons, protons, molecules, there's these, just these different levels of categorization for the sake of functional... Um, calculation. And similarly, this way of dividing reality into solidity, liquidity, movement, and heat is just a really intuitive way the body can grasp and understand the world in a radically different way. So this is 
when you look at the solid elements in the body, um, the bones, the skin, and just notice solidity, earth. This is all the earth element. It's no different than the earth below you. It's just you've imbibed it for a time and now it rests in this body. The liquidity, the blood, the pus, the liquids in the body, this is just water. It comes in and out and you'll give it back to the world. It's no different than the world. This is just a piece of the world. The air element, which is movement, um, this will give back to the world as well and heat. And you can move through that uh, progression like we did in the guided meditation where you imagine giving each of these back to the world and merging again. You can also invoke these elements in a really powerful way in meditation. So if your meditation feels restless and ungrounded and hot, think earth and just let your body ground into that still, cool, earthy place like soil or loam when your hands are deep in it after gardening. If your body feels kind of claustrophobic and the breath is getting kind of stuck and it feels heavy, think water. Just imagine water and let the sort of awareness move and it should allow this movement into the body or air. And sometimes the Buddha added two more elements. He added consciousness and space. And there will come times after, in breath meditation, much of what you're doing is following the, the, uh, the air element, the sort of movement through the body. And often after doing that for a time, the mind and heart will become bright enough that they don't want to be kind of trapped in this cocoon of the body. The Christians call it a mantle of clay. And you'll feel your natural intuitive sense of the mind expand in a wide, buoyant bubble, sort of it'll extend beyond the bounds of the body. And when that happens, you might initially feel kind of claustrophobic and hot, but all that means is you need to switch to the space or consciousness element. So just think consciousness and let that awareness expand out and occupy this bright, beautiful space. The analogy for a deep state of concentration called the fourth jhana the, the Buddha gives the analogy of a man covered in a white cloth so that no part of his body is untouched by the white cloth. And as awareness does refine, there is this sense of, there can be the sense of the consciousness being slightly different, slightly separate from the body, hovering over it. And the last and final um, way of contemplating the body is called the charnel ground contemplations, which are pretty much what you'd think they would be, which is thinking about bodies in various states of decay. And this can be quite intense, so um, it's only something to do if you really feel like you want to try. But in Thailand, monastics will often go to autopsies and watch, um, watch bodies get cut open. Uh, most monasteries will be near a funeral pyre and Often people will bring a body to burn there, and there's something about seeing a body go where you realize it's just a body. And so you can imagine this if you want, a, a corpse laid out like a log, and then it decaying into the ground, the bones scattering, coming to dust. And then if it helps, before you do that, you can imagine consciousness leaving the body, so it's, if that helps, make it a little less intense. And then imagine the body coming back to the earth, the bones fading back in. Every bit of earth we touch has been bones before. We just are sitting on bones. All the chairs you're sitting on have likely been, maybe that metal has been in a body before. This earth is just recycling again and again. We're no different, and these bodies are just part of nature. And these perceptions, if dropped in, can have profound effect, especially to a calm mind. One day you wake up after one of these contemplations and you realize that the body laying on the bed is no different than the bed or the forest around it or the earth. And there's this profound sense of relief and letting go in that. It's not dour or aversive, it's just expansive. And the heart is allowed to breathe. With Buddhism, it's hard because people can really take 
what we're saying as looking down on the world as aversive or pessimistic. All we're doing is acknowledging that we tend to feed on the world and become mesmerized by what we know is not worth becoming mesmerized by and tying our hearts to. We know this body will change. We know it's never good enough for us. It's never perfect. And yet, we invest so much of our hearts in it and so much time, the cosmetics industry. And what a relief if we can just let go a little bit. So every time in Buddhism you hear something like, look at this as impermanent, see this as changeable, it's important to say we say that on one level, that's wisdom, but in tandem, we develop the first two aspects of the path of morality, ethical action, and samadhi, emotional brightness of the heart, of the citta. And that's beginning to glow in the background. It's as if we have been mesmerized by the veil of the bride this whole time, and all we're doing is letting that veil fall so that we can see the face of, of the heart again through it. And yes, that requires us to let go of the veil a little bit and see that it's just a veil. But also at the same time, we develop care, generosity, we develop the heart, we sit in meditation, we devote our lives to what's meaningful, and that's the face of the transcendent growing behind that veil. And it's harder to articulate what that is than what we're letting go of, which is why we don't always articulate it as much. But that's always there in the background. You come together here with others. You show each other love. You give. You meditate. And the citta, the mind and heart, grows bright. And this is where Buddhism shines. In the DSM-4, there was, I think, nearly a 1,000 pages dedicated to ways people could be mentally ill, and I think like two pages to mental well-being. The DSM-5 got it a little bit better. I think they had 150 pages dedicated to mental well-being, or like what wholesome emotional states looked like. And Freud famously said, the best I can do is transform your neurotic misery into normal human unhappiness. <laughs> and this is where Buddhism shines, is there's such a powerful development of wholesome states. So yes, we learn to let go of feeding and attaching to what's unworthy, but we still can hold it. We live in the world, we live with bodies, but we hold it with a light touch, and we enter the world with a sense of giving. And however strange and esoteric and off-putting body contemplation can seem, it's worth having available to you. Because truly, if you begin to just let go of that perception just a little bit, you begin to be able to perceive your own heart and others better. The veil becomes thinner, and the chit is able to shine through. So good luck, everyone, with that. Um, I know people who have begun this practice and looked up pictures of dead bodies and being really, I think someone said, I've never been so worried about someone discovering my shirt search history than, when I, than since I was 13 years old. <laughs> so. So, you know, you can go incognito mode for that, but it can be useful, and it's worth giving a try, and it's worth having in your back pocket. So I hope that didn't turn anyone off too much, but it's a useful practice to have. So I think we'll do questions instead of breakout groups for this one. Um, <laughs> so if people uh, have anything they'd like to bring up, talk about, or ask, just um, raise your hand, and either I can repeat the question. I think I'll just repeat the question out loud for everyone, so no need to use two mics. Um, yeah, so if you're on Zoom, you can raise your electronic hand. And Cheryl, I can just repeat it through here. It's OK. And if you're in person, you can raise your normal hand. And please feel free to ask about this one. It's a, 
it's not often talked about in Western Buddhism. Rick? So Rick asked about uh, talking about space contemplation. It's something he's tried, but was sort of wondering about some of the ins and outs of it. Um, I haven't used it a lot either. Um, I think in the suttas it's referenced sometimes as just noticing the space in the body, like the areas in the nostrils and the throat, just there are these hidden places of space. Um, but I find Longpur Sumedho and others also just talk about it in terms of looking at the space in a room, we just look past it all the time, um, and it sort of holds everything in it. Uh, Tuaria Salah says that the contemplation of space or silence allows sound just to be sound, allows a form just to be form. You know, so I, I think they're using the sound of silence, I think, can be a useful way to bring in that spacious element as well. Um, but I've always appreciated that way of working with space, of sort of paying attention to just the space around something as a calming substrata, rather than the mind kind of latching onto something like a koala bear. You know, it sort of allows it to just float a little more. Um, but honestly, how I've used it mainly has just been if the mind becomes sort of bright and energized enough through calm that it wants to expand out of the body a bit or just gain a bit wider scope, I, I often think space or consciousness. But I think in the suttas, it's specifically like the space within the body. Yeah. Oh, uh, Zoom. Just a hello. second, we're unmuting you. Who is it? Hello. Oh, hello, we can hear you, please. Um, I think it's, there's echo, I can hear myself. How oh, about I now, still echo? Is the YouTube unmuted or muted? I think it's good now. Okay, it's good. Okay, go on. Um, so my question's about, um, I, I really, I like watching dance video and I can see why, you know, the body making pretty shape and movement and moving and synchronization. But another thing is that I can see why people like dancing, like, and I was I was not able to really um, understand that that feeling of excitement. Like why why are people excited when they dance? And I feel the same, but like I don't I don't know why I can't break down break break it down in terms of dharma. Like why? <laughs> why, from a dharmic perspective, do we like to dance? Right? <laughs> I think. No, I think that's a valid question. Um, I don't know completely, but I think, you know, it's important to say that just looking at the body as a body doesn't mean not, um, you know, using it in ways that feel joyful and uh, wholesome. Um, and I think uh, some people, especially if they've had a really constrained relationship with their body, dance can be a way that they just are friends with their body for a second and let it speak. Ayananda Bodhi has an interesting practice where she'll set two cushions ap across from one another and she'll sit on one as her mind and write a letter to her body. And then she'll move to the other cushion and receive the letter and read it as her body and write a letter back to her mind. And I think for some people where the split has been really intense, um, probably based, you know, I, I imagine trauma can contribute to this as can just negative body image is so prevalent. Um, I think dance and some movement is a way of for people to come back into contact and relationship with their body and express through it. Um, although I think some exercise can actually be threaded with uh, an aversive state of pushing oneself as well. So, you know, monks don't dance. Um, we don't necessarily, like, encourage people to dance, but we also don't look down. You know, it's it's okay if you dance, I mean, fair enough. Um, maybe choose the place and time, and clubs probably aren't great things. Um, there is a sutta where the Buddha 
doesn't he he sort of dispraises dancing, but I uh, my sense is it's one of those things that in the lay life it's not you know it it's it's something that it's not terribly unwholesome to do or anything and coming into contact and joy with with bodily movement is is okay i imagine So the question is, uh, with the talk on culture war pacifism a few weeks ago, um, we talked about kind of um, preventative measures of not imbibing news as much. So in this case, there seems to be the curative aspect of body contemplation. Is there also a similar, similar preventative uh, aspect, such as restraint in um, taking in such stimulus or something, commercials, it's just everywhere? Yeah, sense restraint is important, and it's an act of sense restraint. Indri it's called indriya sangwara, and um, it can often be characterized as a sort of self-denial, but it really is an act of self-compassion. Like if you start to meditate and feel what it feels like to when the fever gets going of, of greed, it's it's exciting and kind of is a rush, but. It always lets down, it never ends, and it's drinking salt water. It just makes it worse every time. Th there's no end that way. And the more you see that, the more you really can look at it, and, and the more you begin to perceive this quiet, s clean burning happiness underneath the surface of sensual desires that's there all sort of hovering and growing uh, as you practice, the less you know, the less you're attracted to those, to those stimulus. And the Buddha compares sense desires to feeding off of them to, um, oh God, I'm just hitting you all with so many intense metaphors, to, uh, to a leper picking their scabs and cauterizing them over a fire. So it's like there's a measure of, there's a measure of uh, satisfaction in picking a scab, but you know it's not going to help anything. Um, and it doesn't lead to good health. And so... Once again, one can live in the world, one can go to good meals, uh, have beautiful experiences, but to feed on them, it, it's just useful to know the limits that that gives you. And yeah, to notice how much the world will just try to grab you and how you are grabbed. Um, I'd say a big one is uh, the more gross forms of that sort of stimulus, it's, it is important to really restrain from. So if you can avoid watching commercials in the same way, um, uh, you know, and then some of the more intense forms of sexual stimulation that are available in entertainment, if you can really pull back uh, abstinence in that, in that realm, that is good. Uh, pornography is an intense, uh, intense thing that is uh, everywhere right now, and I don't think it's probably great for people's hearts.
So, uh, good question. The question was, um, this person uses uh, body contemplation often as the elements, and there's a beauty she sees in that in terms of letting go of the elements into nature, and it seems like the uh, elements or the practice of looking at the parts of the body is more, um, has an aspect of kind of really seeing it as not beautiful and almost almost aversion in a sense. And she's wondering if she's missing something by not engaging in that part of it. it like, is, is she skipping over something? Does there need to be some aversion to the body in the process? Is that about right? I think this is one reason why elemental contemplation is so useful for people who either have really struggled with body image or are aversive types is because it is a lot easier not to have, um, there's a beauty in that and, and it's very clear how this body merges back into the world and, and there is a connectivity and wholeness to that. Um, much of the wisdom that I've heard says that we are so attached to the body that often it's useful to, to go a bit the other way, which is where a suba comes in. Um, and it's just something you kind of have to experiment with, like from a calm place when the mind has that brightness and power. Uh, if you do bring up one of the 32 parts or the charnel ground contemplations, if you look at the bones, um, or at the fact that this body is constantly oozing oil, like there's a sense of like, ugh, but does it lead to a, does it also, do you come out of it with a sense of coolness and brightness? Does the mind begin to rise? And if so, then it is it is worth going into if you can. Um, and if you do this contemplation quite a lot, odds are one certain one won't work all the time. It's such a powerful practice that the defilements will block it quite quickly if they can. Um, it really hamstrings a lot of defilement at its there, so many of our defilements are braided into the body. If you can let go of a little bit of your attachment to it, it just, greed, hatred, and delusion all become much more mild, I think. Um, but the elemental contemplations, I think, are more refined contemplations. Like, there's a teacher named Lompor Plian, and a monk was asking him about uh, looking at food as repulsive, um, because it becomes part of the body and, you know, what happens to food. Um, and he said, that's, that's kindergarten. The elements is high dhamma. And I've met, there's a teacher named Longpur Si. He's the most senior Ajahn Chah, or oldest Ajahn Chah disciple still alive. And we went and visited him in Thailand, and all he talked about was the elements. He just said earth, air, fire, wind, and, or earth, air, wind, water. No, earth, air, fire, water. I got it, right? Okay. <laughs> and. And what you see is often to hold that perception in mind requires a pretty profound state of concentration to really, because suddenly you see everyone's just earth and water. It's, it's wild. And it just rips apart the sense that there's nothing for self to stand on. Um, I remember uh, one monk talking to someone who'd just, just gotten a parking ticket, and he was like, well, you can't really go to the police officer and say, all I see is one aggregate of earth water, fire, and water, handing a, another aggregate of, you know, <laughs> doesn't work, but, but it does, it is pretty profound, but I find it's not always accessible, and the 32 parts are a bit more accessible. In the Kayagata Sut Sati Sutta, Mindfulness of the Body, the Buddha compares sorting through the body parts to a farmer sorting through different types of rice and barley, separating them out. He compares the elements to the hide of a cow being cut by a butcher from the underlying flesh of the cow, uh, and the sinews are craving. So you think about ancient India, that's a way more intense metaphor. And the point is like the elements, the ele elemental contemplations have the potential to cut through, every, through so much. So it's a long answer, but yep. Yes. Uh, yes, you in the back, yes. Yeah. 
So uh, I, uh, the question is, I described greed, hatred, and delusion, the three root defilements, um, in detail, but I kind of, I described greed and aversion in some detail, but glossed over delusion. That's a famous question. Um, someone asked that to Longport Shaw. He said, uh, I see greed and hatred, or greed and aversion, but I can't find delusion. And Longport Shaw said, you're riding a horse and asking where the horse is. <laughs> and uh, it got mistranslated in a funny way. Uh, yeah, I won't go into it. Um, <laughs> but um, there's greed and hatred are the two arms of delusion. It's the pushing away and the pulling towards out of craving. When delusion's prominent, though, it often manifests as indifference and distraction. Um, and a deluded type character will often just be a bit uh, nebulous, um, spacious. Each of those three types can mature. So I think one useful way of thinking about it is, f is greed types easily mature into faith. Uh, aversive types easily mature into wisdom. And delusion types can mature into spaciousness and equanimity. That's not totally commentarial. It's just something I, I've heard and noticed as well. So yeah, delusion's harder to pick out, but it can be a sense of kind of fuzziness. And uh, yeah, the Buddha said, greed is a small stain. Sorry, a small stain, but it takes a long time to cure. Greed types, like, life's pretty good. It's the scenic route. Aversion is a large stain, but is quick to become cleansed um, because it's very unpleasant to be angry. And aversive types see the difficulty, and, and often they, they don't want to take the scenic route to transcendence. Delusion is a large stain and takes a long time to fix. So it's never fun when you get labeled as a delusion type. <laughs> yeah. We do have to wrap things up. Um, Maybe one more question at most. I don't know who to pick. <laughs> Gary, yeah. I hear a lot of aversion in, uh, I guess it would be the usefulness of some of these contemplations to keep from attaching. But maybe it's a personality matter, but my tendency is to look more closely uh, and to emphasize, uh, understand and appreciate the reality for what it is, <coughs> rather than being turned away from it. And I'm wondering if you can comment on, on these things. So the question is, you know, the person hears in these practices quite a lot of kind of aversion and pushing away whereas his approach has often been to look deeply or try to look deeply into something and see and appreciate and then let go. I think that's great. And you'll notice none of the contemplations we're saying are un... It's all just real. Like, this body does ooze oil constantly. It is made of calcium and bone. And the thing is, we look at the other aspects so much. Like, think about how much time we take to upkeep our looks um, we're so skewed one way, all a suba is is seeing reality by balancing it out with some of these other obvious facts, like, you know, this is just skin. You know, I mean, that's not this aversive thing. It's just this obviously reality that we overlook every time we, you know, become distraught by a new wrinkle, you know? And, <laughs> and, and there is this appreciation. Um, body contemplation can really trigger people because our delusion in it is so deep that we don't know we're deluded. And it's, it's just worth from a calm place. You know, first, it's just good to have in your tool belt if a rash of lust comes up and it's painful. So it's like a cooling water. But otherwise, just from a calm place, bringing up some of these elements, and yeah, all you're doing is the reality of it. So just look at the bone as a bone. And it, breaking it apart is just seeing inside of it. There's nothing made up about it. it. It'll do that someday, you know? So, yeah, um, we're just trying to see behind the play act a little bit and gain a balanced view, but that you're onto something. Like, there shouldn't be an aversion. Like, oh, this is the body. And you start to feel some friendliness to it because you stop expecting it to be so perfect and 
just like they're these kind of awkward things that try their best for us, and then they they can only work for 80 or 90 years, and then they're they're gone. So it's a good point. And yeah, if if it's leading to aversion, then pulling back is good. Yeah. So just people should use this stuff carefully. A lot of loving kindness, and if it leads to any aversion, just come back to the breath and these positive things. But it is good to have in the back pocket, I think. Does that help at all? So the saying sort of help, but also trying to look at it as just can I appreciate, but also not grasp. I think that's great. I think one of the issues is we don't realize we're grasping, and this just helps us see it a little bit better. But you're right, absolutely right. That's the thing is pushing away, holding at arm's length and holding it to your chest are both holding. Can you like let go, you know, and hold lightly? 